The shape of an automobile has undergone enormous transformations since the first affordable Model T by Ford Motors in 1908. What influenced these changes? How did we end up with the shape for Tesla's Model 3? In this lesson, we will discuss the fundamental forces acting in external flows that shaped our engineering journey, which transformed automobiles from Model T in 1908 to today's Model 3. Engineers study external flows to understand the distribution of forces acting on a solid body. These forces are a result of both normal pressure as well as tangential shear applied by the fluid. The normal stress is because of fluid pressure and wall shear is due to fluid viscosity. These individual contributions can be combined to obtain the total resultant force acting on this external body. The resultant force is described by two distinct components. One in the direction of the upstream velocity, commonly referred to as the drag force, and another in the direction normal to the flow, which is called the lift force. These forces are typically described in terms of dimensionless parameters called the lift and drag coefficients, CL and CD respectively. In addition to these forces, there is also a side force component in the direction normal to the lift drag plane. If P and tau W are the pressure and viscous stresses acting on a small area dA, the overall drag and lift forces are given by the following integral. Therefore, a sound knowledge of these stresses is required to obtain the overall drag and lift forces. In this lesson, we will learn about the implications of drag force acting on a body. For most engineering applications, drag force is the overall resistive force offered by the fluid to the motion of a moving solid and is always non-zero in viscous flows. For example, an aircraft flying to its destination uses the energy generated by burning aviation fuel to overcome the total drag force experienced during the flight. Typically, an aircraft drag is measured in drag counts, where one drag count is equal to 1e-4 times the drag coefficient. The drag count experienced by a commercial airliner during cruise flight is between 200 and 400. A reduction in drag by one drag count saves 3 to 4 percent of aviation fuel to fly the same distance. Imagine how much weight and thus greenhouse emission this could potentially save. On a parallel, Formula One is another field where you see aggressive competing innovation over a tenth of a second advantage. A driver with a car that has a slightly lower drag compared to the rest is going to have a huge advantage. For cyclists racing the Tour de France, the aerodynamic drag force accounts for 70 to 90 percent of the resistance felt during pedaling. If you've seen videos of the race, you would notice the cyclists curve their backs and bend forwards. Why do you think they do this? This minimizes the aerodynamic drag, which helps them travel faster without expending much energy. Drag force is not always the bad guy. There are applications where it becomes critical component for operation. A sailboat requires the drag force experienced by the sail due to the wind for propelling the boat forward. A parachute slows the motion of a falling body because of this drag force. In these two cases, the aerodynamic resistance offered by the fluid becomes beneficial and necessary. The fluid drag has two components pressure or form drag 
and viscous or friction drag. The overall value of the drag is the sum of these individual components and is primarily influenced by the shape of the moving body, the flow Reynolds number, surface roughness of the body and other dimensionless quantities such as Mach number and Froude number. When air flows over a bluff body such as a cylinder, the boundary layer on the cylinder starts to grow. The flow remains attached to the surface of the cylinder and the fluid is trying to overcome the resistive shear forces exerted by the cylinder. This is referred to as friction or viscous drag. This component of drag is because of tangential shear of the fluid. The flow remains attached until it encounters adverse pressure gradient. At this point, the fluid layers adjacent to the surface are brought to rest and the flow separates. This creates a recirculation zone which causes the local flow reversal. In some cases, the separated flow reattaches itself back to the surface of the body. Whereas, in other cases, it leads to the formation of a relatively low pressure region behind the body called wake. With high pressure region in the front and low pressure region at the back, the moving cylinder is being pulled backwards by the fluid. This is the consequence of pressure or form drag on the cylinder. Pressure drag results from normal stress exerted by pressure forces and is dominant in flows around bluff bodies. The greater the size of the wake, the greater is the pressure drag. One way of reducing the pressure drag would be to reduce the size of this wake. Streamlining the body reduces the adverse pressure gradient by spreading the overall resistive force over a large area. Therefore, if we add a tapered section to the cylinder, we observe that the boundary layer separation is delayed and leads to smaller sized wake. In fact, there is no flow separation in this particular streamlined geometry. This reduces the overall pressure drag and for this example, the pressure drag is reduced by a factor of 3. However, the flow remains attached to the surface over a larger area. Therefore, we end up with a larger viscous drag component compared to the cylinder case. Having said that, the total drag experienced by the streamlined body is smaller compared to that of the cylinder by nearly two and a half times. As these two components are equally critical to the overall drag, optimizing the geometry is an engineering problem. Let us take the same flow around the cylinder example to illustrate the variation of drag with increasing Reynolds number. For really low Reynolds number, the flow around the cylinder remains attached to its surface. The drag value obtained in this case is purely because of viscous or shear resistance. There is very little pressure drag here. As the Reynolds number increases slightly, we have a steady separation of boundary layers. The separation as well as the recirculating zones at the top and bottom ends of the cylinder are symmetric. The total drag, which is a combination of both pressure and viscous drags, is lower for this case compared to the previous. As Reynolds number increases further, around 100, the flow breaks away from the top and bottom ends of the cylinder alternatingly to form an unsteady wake. In fact, the wake consists of pairs of alternating vortices 
that are stable in time. This is called Carmen Vortex Street. Do you think you've ever seen this happen in nature? Next time you visit a hilly area, look out for the clouds moving around the hill. You will see a steady looking swirl pattern in them. Here, the overall drag continues to fall because of low viscous shear contribution. The drag coefficient curve is relatively flat in the 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 5 range. In this range, the fluid experiences an adverse pressure gradient towards the rear end of the cylinder and the flow separates completely. As the flow Reynolds number approaches 10 to the power of 5, the boundary layer is transitioning from laminar to turbulent. After the critical Reynolds number of 3 into 10 to the power 5 is reached, the drag coefficient drops down significantly because of the boundary layer in the front portion of the cylinder becoming turbulent. Turbulent boundary layers have greater inertial force and can overcome the adverse pressure gradients experienced near the body. Because of this, they are able to remain attached longer, leading to the formation of smaller sized wakes. This reduces the pressure drag experienced by the cylinder and eventually a low drag value is obtained. The abrupt reduction in the drag coefficient is called the drag crisis. If the solid surface is rough, the drag crisis occurs earlier at smaller Reynolds numbers. In fact, this is the primary reason for dimples on a golf ball. These dimples trip the laminar boundary layers into turbulent, thereby forcing the flow to remain attached longer. This reduces the overall drag and the dimpled golf ball travels a larger distance compared to a smooth ball. The goal to reduce the drag is universal in all ball games. Spinning the ball helps increase the local turbulence on the ball surface, thus lowering the overall drag. So you see how critical this one component, drag, is from transportation to sports.